actually has the highest proportion of migrants in the world. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Carmen and I moved to Perth, Australia seven years ago when I was only 17. I got my Australian permanent resident visa not too long ago in 2021. I really hope that this video can shed some light on how this process looks like. A little disclaimer here, I'm by no means an expert in migration. All the things I'll be sharing here is a compilation of my experiences and also the paid legal advice I got. When you're an Australian permanent resident, you get a tons of benefits such as you get to enjoy Medicare, which is the government's health insurance, you can buy a house without foreign taxes, and you can borrow money quite easily and at a lower interest rate. You can also study at domestic rates, which is so much cheaper, three times to be exact. Plus, applying for a job, it's much easier. When I first started off, I got rejected multiple times, so if you're in a similar boat, I will be linking a video to uh, how do you get a job as an international. There are lots of reasons why some people don't get their PR, it could be poor planning or just poor timing. But let's get right to it. Step number one is really to get expert advice. It saves me so much money and time in the long run. Prior to moving to Perth, my parents engaged with a migration agent, but even prior to that, I did my own research, which brings me to step number two, doing due diligence. Researching the Australian government websites and the state migration web pages, or even watching this video. I was researching for jobs that are on the skilled occupation list because only jobs that are in demand would have the opportunity to apply for the skilled migration visa. Because I would love to do finance, and I did actually end up majoring finance, but to go down that route, I would have to be a finance manager. As opposed to accounting, it's on the list. Once I got my student visa and I selected my study, which is accounting and finance, there, there I go, I came to Australia and started studying. But before I completed my degree, I made sure to apply for internships because that would lead me to step number three, which is applying and securing a job in your field of study. I was pretty focused on applying uh, with my occupation. There are plenty of routes that you could take. You could be sponsored by an employer or a spouse, but I was determined to get here on my own. And the hardest part of this is securing a job in your field, but gaining internship experience is really crucial before you start applying for a graduate job. And once you have that secure, you're pretty much set. And that brings me to step number four, applying for your graduate visa that usually lasts two years. I would also start consulting with a migrant agent or lawyer at this point in time. I engaged with a really lovely lawyer called Lester Ong. He's based in Perth. It was really professional and got me to take an assessment to see how many points I've got. You can do this by yourself too, online, through the immigration page. He also showed me the average points of people receiving an invitation in accounting. At that point in time, it was 75 and I was at 85 points. He mapped out five different routes I could take, which was such a relief because I had no idea back then. I was so anxious until I knew there are a lot of ways to go about this. So I ended up applying for a subclass 190, which is the Scope Migration Visa. Now under this visa, you will have to nominate with a state. And once you receive an approval from the state, you have to remain in that state for two years. The laws might have changed since I've applied, but that was how it was. Now that I know what visa I should apply, it was time to prepare the documents. There's 17 items on this list, so I won't go through all of it, but I'll highlight some to, uh, for you to take note of, and I'll list the rest in the description below. Okay, so for your birth certificate, you want to translate that into English, if, if it's not in English. And for the Australian police check, have it done for all the names that you've got. I have an English name and a Chinese name, and I didn't apply for it, so I had a hiccup. It was only a slight delay, not a big deal, but obviously it would be great for everyone. It would be great to get that ASAP. Next, it would be your English exams. I did PT personally, there's also IELTS, and there's another one, but I like PT because it was easier for me to prepare, and I think it was easier as well to go a high grade. I got all band 8 the first time around, and happy to share my tips and insights on that as well if you're interested. I got some materials from my friend and I just kept practicing and practicing, but it really helped that since a young age, my parents did get me onto English tuition, so I naturally do have 
better English, I think, among my peers. The next thing is to provide all the academic transcripts for the studies that you've done. I did college and then I did my degree. I didn't bother to provide my transcripts for college, but they actually ended up asking me for it, so I had to provide it. Once you've prepared everything, you can submit your EOI, which is the ex an expression of interest to the state. It's pretty much an assessment again, and it's a yes or no, uh, or providing dates, and of that assessment, it will show you how much points you've got. And in my case, it was 85 points. Once you've submitted an EOI, you wait for a day or two. I think it's an automated email that you receive to take to say, yep, yeah, you're You've, you've met the minimum requirement, please submit your documents. Then I just submitted all my documents and, and wait. It took me around three months to receive. Once you receive your invitation from the state, you can start launching an application. And hopefully there's no follow-ups. There were follow-ups for myself, but that's okay. I got it eventually. Then I did my visa medical checkup with Bupa. And if you haven't already, I would I would recommend taking driving lessons so you could pass the driving exams because we do many three times. But uh, mainly because once you've got your PR, you've only got three months until you you can't use your previous driving license. However, that does vary depending on the country you're from. I think for Singapore, you don't have to, but I'm from Malaysia, so bad news. And if you're still tuning in, thank you so much. As a summary of what I've talked about, number one, get expert advice ASAP. It will save you so much time and heartache in the long run, and also money. It really prevents you from going into a rabbit hole as well. Next is securing a job in your field of study. Again, I have a video on it, and if you would like to learn more about if that's your situation or someone's, someone you know situation, you can check it out. In terms of money, I would say put aside 6K. Uh, being totally transparent, the application itself is 4k back when I applied in 2021 and for legal fees it was 2k the medical checkup was 300 English exams was 300 the police checkups were around $50 I believe and lastly it's to lean into your support network this whole process can be so emotionally taxing and no one really talks about it enough so I really hope that this can be a safe and supportive uh, space for you. If you have any questions, please reach out. And I'll see you in my next video. See ya!